Now, our Nobel Week dialogue is mainly about conversations, and for the first of those, we're bringing together the most senior representatives from three organizations with an unparalleled view of migration. We have uh, Jagan Chapagain, who is Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Mark Manley, Head of Resource Mobilization for UNHCR, and Amy Pope, the new Director General of the International Organization of Migration. Their conversation will be moderated by Vidar Helgeson, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation. Please welcome them all. So we've just heard that migration is our history. Migration is in our genome. And still today's discussion about migration in most countries, including this country, is that we need to stop it. Now the question is, if, is that possible? Couple of reflections. If you, if you ask a Swedish industrialist today, what is the major obstacle for your continued growth and expansion of your business? The number one response, and we have data on this, is lack of skilled labor. We need more people. Couple that with the demographics of Europe. We do know that uh, over the next two or three decades, Europe's workforce will decline significantly. So there's already a need for people. There will be a need for more people to cater for more old people. And the discussion today is about stopping migration. Amy Pope, heading the UN's migration agency. Are we having the right discussion about migration today? Absolutely not. And first of all, I have to say, please don't stop migration. As my own great-grandmother came from an area not too far from here, Ostergotland, south of Stockholm, in the 1890s. And because she and her family were extremely poor, and there were no options here. That's what we're seeing around the world today, right? We see uh, pressures on communities that are already vulnerable, whether it's conflict, whether it's growing economic inequality, or whether it's climate change, which are putting um, displacement pressures on communities that just don't have the resilience to manage. At the same time, we have these labor shortages across the top 30 economies just this last year, and that's gonna grow in the years to come. Here in Sweden, in 2050, the working age population is going to plateau. And so migration is going to be necessary in order to respond to the pressures both across the global south, but also here across Europe, North America, and parts of Asia. And when you look at today's debate in Europe, in the US, around the world, um, what can be done to drive your points home? The answer is to take a more strategic approach to the question of migration. Rather than um, having this reflexive end to migration, it's to connect people with opportunities. We understand that the political rhetoric is heightened when people see persons who are coming in an irregular way, whether it's across the channel or across the Mediterranean or to the US Southwest border. But when people come regularly, when people have a visa, when they're going to a job, when they're connected um, into the economy, the outcomes are overwhelmingly positive for the migrant herself, for the community she's going to, and for the community that she's coming from. And what we ultimately see is that migration leads to better development outcomes. I mean, if you just look at the economics alone, remittances from migrants far outstrip any kind of development assistance back into developing communities. So migration actually can be this force for good and transform the way we think about development as a whole. You talk about a force for good, but, but when we hear about migration in the media and in political debates these days, it's mainly about refugee situation, crisis situations, overwhelming uh, local and national 
political contexts or municipal authorities not being able to cope with the refugee inflows. But refugees are not the majority of migrants, right? They're a tiny, tiny piece um, of people who are on the move today, right? So you have about 280 million uh, migrants today around the world. About 35 million, and Mark will correct me um, on this if I'm getting it wrong, are refugees. We have an additional about 70 million people who are displaced within their own countries, and that's overwhelmingly, increasingly, because of the impacts of climate change, right? And, pers and in particular, climate layered on top of conflict. But the vast number of people on the move are going because there are job opportunities. Now the question for all of us working in this world is can we create more regular pathways for people to access job opportunities rather than leaving people in the hands of smugglers um, to cross a very, very unsafe, whether it's a, ju a jungle or the sea, in order to access those opportunities. And this is what the IOM is doing. Could you just give us a couple of words about what the IOM as an organization has, what kind of mandate you have? Yes, yeah, so we are a member state organization, 175 different member states. We work in 170 countries, overwhelmingly in response to humanitarian crises. So for example, IOM has the biggest presence of any UN agency in Ukraine at this moment. We're responding to the floods in Libya or the earthquake in Turkey, for example. But increasingly, we are seeing the need for us as an organization to flip the way we engage. And rather than wait for the crisis to happen, work with governments to build their capacity to have better, more strategic migration policies. Jagan, you head an organization which is, on the one hand, an organization based in Geneva, on the other hand, a federation of national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world working in refugee, acute refugee situations, but with those roots in those national societies. So I guess you also have a, a permanent picture of this. How, how does this situation look from your end, the, the acuteness and the permanence of migration? No, thank you, and, and great to be here in, in Sweden. And thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a challenge. Uh, uh, you know, from the perspective of the, the Red Cross, Red Crescent, as you said, of course, being present in almost every country in the, in the world. Uh, what we see, the migration, or in general terms, the movement of the people, is a very dynamic phenomenon. Sometimes when you uh, live in Europe, I'm living in Geneva now since 2015, it's seen as people trying to come to Europe. That's the sort of the, the very, very monodimensional approach of looking at it. It's much more dynamic than that. Actually, I spent uh, time last year in Latin Central America actually tracking the route of migrants heading to the US and Canada, and this year I did the same in Africa. So what I found was more than 85% of the people actually do not want to move. Mm -hmm. They don't want to leave their home. None of us want to leave our home, even if we are not living in the most developed societies. The second data which I saw was 80% of the people who actually move, they move to the neighboring countries. Yeah. For example, if it is Africa, the 80% of the people who are moving are moving within Africa. And these two, two statistics are extremely important, especially when we have the debate here in Europe to understand. Now, when we look at the people they are moving, I sort of saw, sort of let me put it in the three categories of people moving. One is they are moving because of the conflict, the wars, and because of the lack of protection and safety, people move. People look for safety. And I think that's very natural. All of us would move to a safety if we are subjected to uh, a type of situation that where we could be killed or our family could be killed. Then there's a second category of people who move because of the lack of jobs and livelihood opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you cannot feed your children in the evening and you are hearing the cries of your children every evening before they go to bed, what do you do? That's the type of conversation we need to have. What do you do if your child is crying because your child doesn't have a food to eat in the evening before going to the bed? And almost 700 to 800 million people have that situation today. They go to bed hungry every single day. That's the situation today. 
And of course, there is a third category of people who move because they are looking for opportunities. They want to see the world. They see what things exist outside of their, their environment. And if you look at the history, and I think you were listening to the colleagues earlier, there's a saying that butterflies have always had wings and people have always had legs. When you have legs, you move. And that's what has happened. And Amy, you told your story. Yeah. And each of us, if we look deeper, this has always happened. So we need to really understand the migration as a very dynamic phenomenon. And it's very human. And we need to see it as a human issue rather than a legal or political or a criminal issue. The movement of people should not be criminal, criminalized. And that's what is happening. And I'm very glad to take part in this conversation today. You mentioned the very important word human. I mean, yeah. dehumanization of yeah. groups of uh, people uh, is normal for uh, political gains yeah. in, in many countries. Uh, and when you say that most refugees or people that migrate for for various reasons, are actually moving to their neighboring countries that are much more fragile societies often than our societies up here. Yeah. Uh, in your experience, uh, take the perspective of a local or a national Red Cross or Red Crescent society. How are those communities coping with that influx of uh, massive amounts of uh, neighbors? And I think this would be, uh, this is a very important uh, point of discussion. If you look at Lebanon, a small country going through their own political and economic, economic dis uh, instability, they are hosting millions of people. I think the, uh, probably the people they are hosting is almost more than the, the, the original population. I was just in Egypt. 10 million migrants or refugees are living in Egypt. That's almost 10% of their population. Turkey was hosting a few million, uh, I think close to 3 million people. And I was, I was in Africa, country of Gambia, you know. It's economically, it's, it's part of that LDCs, the least developing countries. And it is hosting people. Of course, the country like Gambia is a country of origin, country of uh, transit, and country of destination. Neighboring countries have moved there. And this is, I think, an important lesson to be learned here, particularly in Europe or, or, the, or the North America, that when the societies see the movement of the people as a human issue, and it's the, it's the people looking for opportunities or looking for safety. And I think that's when we have that type of conversation, then you see the positive side of migration, which Amy touched on. Yesterday, I was flying uh, through Frankfurt to come here, and the announcement there was, oh, we are delayed because we have worker shortages yeah. from ground handling to pilot to the, the, the crew. But in that environment, when you talk about, but why are we not getting people who are looking for jobs? And when I visited these countries, the work of the local Red Cross and Red Crescent societies, working with the local authorities, especially the local mayors and the heads of you know, the local villages and the communities, what they are trying to do is show that human pace, trying to have that discussion with the host communities and trying to have that, uh, that looking from the opportunity point of view, that how the people can add value to the communities and how the communities can actually benefit from that uh, from that experience. Generally, if you look at the studies, the, the people who have migrated, they are hardworking because they are trying to reestablish a life. They, they want to prove, they want to give a better life to their family, their children. So there is a much bigger motivation to contribute to the society they are migrating to. And the country of Gambia, I talked about before, 20% of their GDP comes from the remittances from migrants. So if we see from that perspective, the positive contributions of the movement of the population far outstrips some of the toxic political debate we see in many countries. Hmm. Brief question, do you think that a Red Cross society in Scandinavia could learn from Red Cross or Crescent societies elsewhere when it comes to playing a role in society for facilitating integration? Absolutely, and it is happening. It is happening here in Sweden. The Swedish Red Cross, I visited some of the work they have done here with the migrant population. I visited the Red Cross in Norway. I visited the Red Cross in 
um, Finland and Denmark, and it is happening. It is happening, especially, of course, when we had the huge influx of people coming from Ukraine. We saw a huge engagement of the, of the local Red Cross. And we really want to sort of have that experience sharing and learning to see that how in different countries the Red Cross can contribute positively in this very, very important topic. Mark, the UNHCR, as the UN's refugee agency, uh, you have a specific mandate to deal with crises. You're not, uh, you don't have a mandate for the long-term issues, but, mm -hmm. but crises are permanent. Mm -hmm. What is your perspective on, uh, on how refugee situations are evolving? What patterns do you see? Uh, the past we're coming from and the future we're going towards. Yeah, indeed. UNHCR was created in 1950 on a temporary basis. It was supposed to ensure protection for European refugees and then find solutions for them. And then the office was destined to close. Unfortunately, we've seen over the last uh, 73 years that we continue to see uh, conflicts arise, perse persecution, very serious human rights violations continue to occur. People are forced from their homes, from their communities, in many cases they cross borders. Um, and as a result of that, uh, our mandate has been extended, uh, unfortunately. Um, I think it's worth dwelling on the, on the point of, uh, I think Jagan has referred to it, but uh, there's a misperception that um, Many of the people are arriving in North America or uh, in, in Europe, but what we're seeing is that, for the most part, people who are displaced because of conflict, violence, and persecution remain in their own countries. They like to stay close to home if they can, because they want to return home eventually to their own communities. If they're forced across the border, in 69% uh, of cases, they remain in a neighboring country. Most of those countries, are low and middle income. Yeah. Um, so that means that uh, our workforce around the world is, is focused on delivering in emergency contexts uh, on these, in these frontline countries, uh, which are in many cases uh, receiving refugees very generously, but did not have a lot of resources themselves to respond. Um, so for example, if we look at uh, what one of the, the, the situations which is of most concern today, it's Sudan, Sudanese refugees uh, who fled since the fighting erupted there in April. They're arriving where? They're arriving in Chad, they're arriving in South Sudan, to a lesser degree in, in Egypt. Chad and South Sudan are two of the poorest countries in Africa. So they are delivering a global public good, but they need assistance in, in doing so. Um, and that's why we count very much on, on the support of uh, the government of Sweden and the people of Sweden um, to, to be able to deliver uh, protection and assistance at the front line. Um, it's also worth mentioning, though, that um, conflict in the past, f f frequently we, we saw it erupted, there was a peaceful solution, and people were able to return home. What we're seeing now is that frequently conflicts are uh, lasting much longer. If there is a peaceful solution, it's more fragile, and that makes it more difficult for people to uh, return. So looking back to, to when UNHCR last won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1981, the committee referred to uh, several situations. Two of them were Vietnam, Vietnamese refugees, uh, and uh, Afghan refugees. The Vietnamese, uh, largely through resettlement, uh, found a solution. Uh, one of the first refugee families I ever met in Canada, uh, where I'm from, uh, was a Vietnamese family. That demographic group is among the top income earners in Canada now um, because there were policies in place to ensure that they were able to, su to succeed. The Afghans, on the other hand, 43 years later, in most cases, they're still waiting for solutions. So we still have approximately 6 million Afghans around the world. And we're seeing more and more situations like that where we have long-lasting crises. Mm -hmm. And that means the international community needs to ensure that we help those asylum countries which, uh, which uh, are hosting these very large numbers of people. On that note, on the, the, the lasting conflicts, there, were, there was a poll in one of the Swedish dailies just a couple, of days, a couple of days ago about attitude towards receiving refugees from Ukraine. When the war started, there was an outburst of sympathy 
all parties, even the most vehement anti-immigrant parties, were sort of supportive of taking refugees. Now, public support for Ukrainian refugees, is, or for refugees in general, is back to where it was before the war started, which was a fairly negative number. I'm wondering from your perspective, how, how do you see the links between uh, protracted crises, media reporting, the political dynamics around these, these issues, and how the public responds? Indeed, there is a very close link between what we see in the media and, and public, per, public perceptions. Um, in the case of the Ukrainian refugees, uh, we were able to respond on the ground very effectively among agencies, um, in large part because there was an outpouring of support uh, for, uh, for our action um, and outpouring of support in different ways. So in the case of uh, responding in inside Ukraine or in, in frontline countries like Moldova. Uh, we were able to do that because, for example, many Swedes provided financial contributions to Sweden for, for UNHCR. Um, the Swedish government also stepped up uh, generously. Um, but we also saw something very, very important, Vidar, which is that individuals and companies welcomed people and provided support to them. And this goes to, to Jagan's point on the local response, um, because this needs to be an all of society response. In my experience, if people uh, have a direct positive interaction uh, with refugees, then the support can be sustained over a longer period of time. What we do not like to see, I mean, we as, as humans, we don't like to see chaotic situations. Um, and this speaks to the importance of policy so that public support can be sustained over time. But um, almost inevitably, as crises uh, grow long in the tooth, people tire them of them, uh, attention focuses el elsewhere, um, and support may, may decline. And I think this goes to, to Amy's point of being able to ensure that, uh, in this case, refugees are able to contribute positively to, to host countries. We see it overwhelmingly uh, in, in the course of the last 70 years that they can if the parade policies are in place, and that helps sustain support over time. Just one last point. I, my previous appointment was in, uh, in Mexico, um, and we saw that, and I saw in many, many, many cases, if people are given the opportunity to support themselves and their families through legal employment, if their children are able to go to school, if they have access to health care, because they're included in national programs, um, then their lives are transformed very, very quickly. Um, and this is really uh, what, we, what we need to be seeing, in particular in those frontline countries where frequently refugees, unfortunately, uh, are in camps. They're not necessarily included in national programs, um, if they exist, um, and uh, they're not necessarily given the opportunities to support themselves through livelihood access to land and employment. Um, so this is one of the main points that we're working on now in the UN system um, as a result of um, decisions made in 2018 following the Syrian refugee crisis uh, through the Global Compact on, on Refugees. Um, and will be discussed actually the coming week at the Global Refugee Forum in Geneva among governments, international agencies, um, development banks, private sector, uh, and refugees, refugees themselves. Well, governments have a lot on their agenda, and these days a lot of acute things on their agenda. And yet you're saying they need to plan and they need to equip local communities to be able to cope with these situations longer term, beyond, beyond the sympathy outburst. Things, things will always work well in the, in the short term, but to be successful you need those, uh, long, that long-term planning for, for crisis. How are you working on, on that, Amy? So in some ways, it's just in terms of what makes sense, right, in terms of financial costs and human cost. So think in a country like Sweden, um, there's generous development support and generous humanitarian support for communities already around the world. But what hasn't happened as much and what needs to happen uh, if we want to get this balance right, is to connect that development and humanitarian support to the people who are most in need. So for example, take a country like Gambia, where we know that there are many people who are migrating irregularly because 
of lack of opportunity or increasingly because the ability to make a life there is difficult. And that will become more true as a result of climate change. Right? Gambia, for example, is extremely vulnerable to future climate shocks. They're almost entirely reliant on something like rainfall agriculture. So if we connect the dots, right, we look at the communities where people are coming from, we look at what is driving them to come, and we put assistance into either building out options to improve their resilience to climate change or to improve their options at home. And when there are no options at home, we look at options for them to migrate with dignity and to migrate regularly. And it, we are at this moment in time where these pieces will align because even as we see the number of young people increase across Africa at this moment, we are seeing the aging population across other parts of the world. So this is not, this is not a, a situation where people will lose. If we structure this in a way that we connect particularly with lower skilled, more vulnerable people, if we can connect them to the opportunities that are emerging globally, we will see benefits for all economies and all people. You're saying if we could, but what is the receptiveness of say, European governments for that discussion? So I'm looking for the coalition of the willing, right? So we are really looking at the private sector who overwhelmingly will tell us they do not have a sustainable workforce now or for their future. Um, and, you know, a little fun fact, we have been um, advised that, that we will not meet the Paris climate goals if we don't actually have migration as part of the solution because quite simply today, there's not a workforce to transition to a green economy, right? So we're looking for the coalition of the willing, whether it's the private sector, whether it's small town mayors who are desperate to have a sustainable workforce to care for aging populations, or in some cases it's mayors from country or from cities that have emptied out as populations have shifted within their own country. I'm not going to win the culture wars, right? But little by little, we want to demonstrate how this works and how it will benefit all communities. I think if there are viewers online from the northern part of Sweden, they will hear you on this one. <laughs> Can I come in sure. this one? You know, I think the, because we are dealing with so many problems and the governments have to deal with multiple crises, I think that is the main reason the investment has to be at the local level. You know, when you go to the communities, you go to the village or the communities, they don't distinguish between different issues. You know, they, you know, when you go to the local level, they have needs and they have aspirations. Mm -hmm. That's it. So what do you do? When you invest at those local level, you address to their needs and you support their aspirations. And when that happens, a lot, lot of the other issues we are dealing with are the consequences of lack of investment at the community level. And that is, I think, for the governments, the leaders, if they are listening, my advice would be, if you want to avoid dealing with multiple crises around the world now, or at least you can reduce significantly, if you invest in that community resilience, strengthen the community, the, the, the family units, I think that's the, way to, uh, uh, that's the way to go. So that's why from the, you know, all of us, I think the, we are so aligned that we need to invest in those, in those community levels. Am I also sensing from what all of you are saying that, that at the local level, in communities, there is a receptiveness to finding solutions Absolutely. and that there is a discrepancy between the local realities Absolutely. and the polarized national debates. Absolutely. That's your sense. Yeah. Absolutely. And interestingly, the evidence has shown that in communities that have a lot of migrants, the anti-migrant sentiment tends to be lower. Right? It is more the fear of the unknown, fear of the communities that may be on the sidelines, looking at social media or looking at the news reports and not really understanding how migration can benefit. Now, it's not sufficient to say, okay, this is gonna work out in the long time, in the long term, and everyone should just hold on till then. Governments do need to be engaged in actively working with communities that are hosting especially large numbers of migrants so that you can better address what will be pressures on the system. So if you take a country like Djibouti, it's a million people, right? Djibouti is right in the Horn of Africa at the jumping off point to the Gulf of Aden, over to Yemen and then into the Gulf countries. Djibouti has a million people, 
200,000 people pass through every single year, mostly irregularly, on their way to job opportunities. That's as if in the United States, we had 70 million people crossing from the southwest border to Canada every year. It's, a, it's an enormous number. The, con the government of Djibouti, the people of Djibouti, have been uh, relatively open to the migration trends, but it's fraying. There are so many coming through that it is fraying, right, that you're seeing the social cohesion be impacted. It's a place where we should be engaging, investing to take the pressure off, whether it's healthcare services or other social services, so that you're not overwhelming the structures, particularly of these countries that don't have high capacity to support the influx. Yeah, on that, I think the, the, our, our vision is clear. If you go to the Global Compact on Refugees, which was adopted following the Syrian refugee crisis, it's very clear that we need to have, we call them area-based approaches. So you have investment, probably by, an, by a development actor, the World Bank, for example, that focuses on a specific area benefiting host communities, but also the refugee population, or if we're talking about people who have been displaced inside their country, uh, we're, we're focusing on, on, the, on, the, on the people, the IDPs, internally displaced people, plus the people who are hosting them. And that is really the way forward, because as humanitarian agencies, we have limited resources. We're not designed to sustain health care systems and education over the long term. We're not supposed to be building parallel systems. So what we really need is a comprehensive approach to development in those areas which are most impacted um, by uh, forced uh, displacement. We're coming towards the end. Um, and we started out saying or con confirming that we, we don't have the right debate in many contexts. Now, given your experiences, your insights and experience on the ground uh, and experience from meeting leaders, what should be the debate and, and what would you want from political and industry and civil society leaders in, uh, in the migration and refugee debate going forward? Uh, I think the, maybe the one really important uh, thing is, can we change, let me say, the language? Uh, what I meant by that is, a lot of times we describe migration as a problem, as a challenge, as a crisis. The migration is not a challenge. The challenge is the root causes that is creating this environment, the conflict, the poverty, lack of jobs and lack, lack of livelihoods. And these are just the people looking for opportunities of safety. So I think changing the language from this very negative language to describe the, the, the migration to a phenomenon. This is a phenomenon, not a crisis. I think that would be a really, really important thing. And I think the leaders have to lead with values rather than to be influenced. I think leaders have to have that political courage rather than to be influenced by what is written in the, in the social media. Hmm. The number of people who have been forced from their homes and communities because of violence and persecution, conflict, has increased by a factor of two over the last uh, decade. Um, we are at the breaking point. You know, our ability to respond uh, is, is now being uh, seriously tested. So I think the most important thing to look at now is conflict prevention, resolving conflict, and ensuring that we have sustainable peace so that people are not displaced, and if they have been displaced, so that they can go home. Last word. If we're focusing only on people crossing the Mediterranean, we're forgetting the multiple failure points where we could, as, as a global community, engage to provide much better outcomes. People are crossing for the most part because they're looking for better opportunities, better economic opportunities, and because they find jobs when they land. So ultimately, we need to build a better system that addresses why people are leaving in the first place, supports the communities they're transiting through, and then ultimately creates a more safe, regular, and orderly option for them to migrate with dignity. Amy Pope, Mark Manley, Jagan Chapagain, thank you so much. Thank you very much.